Well, good morning, everyone. If we could take our Bibles and open them to John chapter 16. Looking today probably at just verses 10 and 11. The title of our message this morning is True Evangelism, Part 2. True Evangelism, Part 2. Of course, as you know by now, hopefully, uh, Jesus is the focus of John's Gospel. John, of course, writing a book to identify Jesus as the unique Son of God so that people might believe in Him and have life. Of course, by now we are in the Upper Room Discourse, John 13 through 17, where many, many subjects have been dealt with. We find ourselves in chapter 16, though, and chapter 16 basically revolves around uh, three conversations or rounds of conversation. The first round of that conversation is in verses 1 through 15, and that's what we've been looking at the last couple of weeks. Verses 1 through 4 is a description that Jesus gives these men huddled with him there in the upper room, a prophecy, if you will, of a coming conflict. He describes persecution that they will experience. But then as you move down through that unit of material, he also begins to disclose to them the resources that they will have as they are sent out into the hostile world system as his ambassadors, being mistreated in most places where they would go. But they are not facing these things alone. There is something, better said, someone who's coming alongside to help them to comfort them, and to empower them. And that coming one is none other than the Holy Spirit. He begins to explain in verses 5 through 7 that his ascension will bring forth into the world in an unprecedented way the coming Holy Spirit. And from there, Jesus begins to describe what this Holy Spirit will do. He articulates for them, verses 8 through 11, a ministry that the Holy Spirit is going to have with the unsaved world first. And then later on in this unit of material, he begins to describe the ministry that the Holy Spirit will have to the, to the believer. But we find ourselves in verses 8 through 11, where Jesus is describing what the Spirit of God is going to do in the midst of the unsaved world. I believe that probably these are some of the most important verses to understand. I believe that they are perhaps some of the most neglected verses in all of the New Testament in formulating what the purpose of our lives is. The purpose of our lives is, in essence, not only glorifying God, that is our primary purpose, But there is a reason that God does not take us to heaven the moment we believe. He deliberately leaves us in the world for purposes of evangelism. And our function as Christians is to cooperate, not to go before the Holy Spirit, but to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in the spread of the gospel to the unsaved world. Jesus says, this is not your agenda or your ambition in and of yourselves. This is something that the Spirit of God is going to do. He wants to use you in this great work. And this is what many theologians call true evangelism. Evangelism that cooperates with the Holy Spirit. Evangelism that does not seek to work independent of the Holy Spirit. Evangelism whereby God has chosen to use us in the fulfillment of His purpose. So what exactly is evangelism? How does it work? What are we to focus on as we interact with the unsaved world around us? What exactly are we to say 
what are the main thrusts of the ideas that we are to put forward? We have that given in tremendous detail here in verses 8 through 11. We saw last time in verse 8 that the Spirit is coming to convict the world. Now, the word world there is a reference, as we said last week, to the mass of unsaved humanity, unregenerate people, people that do not know Christ personally. The Spirit of God is going to go and do a great work in their minds. And what is He going to do? Verse 8, you'll remember we saw He is going to convict the world. The idea of convict we saw from the Greek Last time is the idea of convince, reprove, that kind of idea. And so what we have, as we have defined it last week, is this, a supernatural preparation of the mind to the end that an intelligent choice of Christ as Savior may be made. That is exactly what the Holy Spirit is doing amongst unsaved people. He is working in their lives in such a way to bring them to a point where they might make an intelligent choice to believe or to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why does the Holy Spirit have to work in this way? Because we, by virtue of the fact that we are all contaminated by sin, we are all descendants of Adam's rebellious lineage, we do not seek God on our own. We, Romans 3, verse 11, says it well. It says, no one seeks God. Without the Holy Spirit's work in my life, I, as a descendant of Adam's lineage, just fulfill my job description as one steeped in rebellion. And yet the Lord loves me too much to see me go my own way. And consequently, he begins to work. He begins to convince. He begins to reprove. He begins to convict. And consequently, we have to understand that this great work of convincing is not something that is brought forth through human oratory. God chooses at times to use human oratory. But human energy, human manipulation, human scheming, human empowerment, these things do not bring forth the great reproving or convincing work of the Holy Spirit. They are never substitutes for this great move of the Spirit of God. Well, what is the Spirit of God trying to convict us of? When we look at verse 8, When we looked at verse 8 last time, we saw he is convicting the world of three things. Number one, he is convicting the world of sin. That will be described in greater detail in verse 9. He is convicting the world, number two, of righteousness. That will be described in greater detail in verse 10. Number three, he is convicting the world of judgment. That is described in greater detail in verse 11. This is what God is doing with people. It matters very little what we think should be done or how the the work of God ought to go forth. It's a direct statement that God, through the Spirit, is doing these things. And thus, the purpose of evangelism is to align or adjust our approach with what he is already doing. That is true evangelism. That is evangelism that begins to bear fruit because we are cooperating with a divine agenda that is already in motion. And this is what Jesus is describing for these 11 men who will become the first evangelists of the resurrected Christ. We saw there in verse 9 that when he comes, he will convict the world of sin. Now, sin is the Greek word hamartia, which is a singular noun. He is not convicting the world of sins. You know, don't smoke, don't chew, don't go with girls who do kind of thing. Now, 
A lot of legalists and fundamentalists like to point these things out to the world. But you'll notice that Jesus says the Holy Spirit is not convicting the world of these things at all. He is convicting them, though, of a sin. And that sin is described as unbelief. You see that described there in the rest of verse 9. In other words, there is a sin, singular, that the unbeliever is currently committing against God. The Holy Spirit reproves, convinces, convicts them of that particular sin. Bringing them to a point where they might reverse that condition and believe, as we'll see a little bit later, in what Jesus is doing. So we have a threefold description of the Holy Spirit. The threefold description of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the world is explained in verses 9 through 11. The, he, he is targeting the sin of unbelief. But the story doesn't stop there. I believe that's where we ended last time. He convicts the world, though, of two other things. The first one is of the two, so this would be number two total of the three. He convicts the world of righteousness. He not only convicts the world of sin, singular, unbelief, but number two, the Holy Spirit is at work in the world convincing the world of righteousness. We see that unpacked or described in greater detail in verse 10. Notice what verse 10 says says, and concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. What is being described here is not self-righteousness. What is being described here is what theologians call imputed righteousness. A better way of saying it is transferred righteousness. The Holy Spirit has no interest in coming into the mind of an unsaved person and convincing them of their need to try harder. The world of religion will tell you to try harder. Work harder. Be good. Try this. Try that. Get on this program. Get on that program. The Holy Spirit has no interest in that. What the Holy Spirit is interested in convicting the unsaved mind of is their need not for self-righteousness, but their need for the transferred righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ, the man in heaven. There are in the scripture three great transfers. This is the concept of imputation. It occurs three times in the Bible. Number one, Adam's sin is transferred to all of humanity. You'll read about that in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. What Adam did affected all of us. And that is the subject of Hamar theology, or what we call the doctrine of sin. We cannot understand our who we are in the eyes of God until we begin to understand that Adam's sin has been transferred to us. But then there's another transfer that takes place where God the Father transfers our, son, our sin to Jesus Christ. And this is the great doctrine of Christology. He who knew no sin became sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. It is not saying that Jesus became a sinner. If he became a sinner, he could not be our perfect substitute. What it is saying is what was transferred to him was the fact that he at this time became the sin bearer. The sins of the world are transferred to him. He is not a sinner, but he becomes a sin bearer so that he might pay the penalty for all of our sins. That's transfer number two. The type of transfer that is being described here in the book of John chapter 16 and verse 10 is the third transfer, where Christ's perfection, Christ's righteousness is transferred to us at the point of faith in the work of the Savior. It is that third doctrine 
which covers soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, that Jesus is speaking of here when he speaks of the work of the Spirit is to convince men and women of their need for the transferred righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God does not convict people to work harder and to climb a ladder. What he convicts them of is you need something higher than yourself to gain right standing before God. This idea, this third transfer or imputation, is not to be confused with the forgiveness of sins. Most of our theology only goes uh, so, so deep. We say, Jesus forgave my sins, which He did. But you see, in Christ you have so much more than merely the forgiveness of the sins that you have committed against God. What you have in Christ is the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. Lewis Berry Chafer puts it as follows. This is a far different overture than the proposition that sin may be forgiven. It extends to the larger constructive fact that perfect righteousness is imputed to all who believe. At the point of faith, what happens is you, as a lost sinner in Adam's lineage, have now the righteousness of Jesus Christ transferred to you positionally, which means you have a perfect standing with a holy God. God looks at you just like he looks at Jesus Christ. He looks at you through the lens of the perfect righteousness of His Son. In all form and substance, you are, positionally speaking, just as righteous as Jesus Christ Himself. And isn't it interesting how we grovel before God with kind of a warm theology? Oh God, please answer this prayer request. It's just me, God. I'm sorry to bother you. I know I asked for a lot of things. I know I'm not worthy. I know I did this, this, and this this week. But please answer this one request. In reality, the Father is looking at you not as a groveling worm. He is looking at you just like He looks at the second member of the Trinity. Because Christ's righteousness is transferred to us at the point of faith. You see, this is why the book of Hebrews says, go boldly into the throne room of God. We can go before a holy God with boldness. Why? Because we are not entering that throne room through self-righteousness. We are entering that throne room through imputed righteousness or transferred righteousness. By the way, we are not entering into a merit relationship. Dr. Chafer puts it as follows, not entering into a merit relationship which would demand of him that he produce his own righteousness as a basis of acceptance before God. We are not coming to God on the basis of self-worth. We are not coming to God on the basis of merit. We are coming to God on the basis of the righteousness of Jesus has been transferred to me at the point of faith. You see, and the great story of the Bible is this. People want to come to God through their own works. That story begins as early as Genesis 3 and verse 7, right after the fall. Do you remember what our forebears did there in Eden? It says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. That is the first act of religion in the Scripture. Religion is man's attempt to make himself right before God. And how that scenario ended with this, Genesis 3, verse 21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Religion, we've got to clothe ourselves. The transferred righteousness of God, He clothes us through the skin of an animal who was innocent, killed on behalf of Adam and Eve. You see, we are coming to God 
through one of two mentalities. We are trying the Genesis 3 verse 7 approach. I spent the first 16 years of my life doing that. Thinking I could do X, Y, and Z to make God like me, love me, accept me. And then I heard the gospel. I was convicted of it. And I realized that I don't come to God through my own righteousness. I come to God through the righteousness that he transfers to me. I left Genesis 3 verse 7 and moved into Genesis 3 verse 21. And yet how many people in the world are stuck in Genesis 3 verse 7? What is going to get them out of that condition? The work of the spirit of conviction and persuasion that only the Holy Spirit can do in the heart of a person can change their minds. Isaiah 64 and verse 6 says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. Did you know that God looks at man's works and religious activity as a filthy garment? In other words, God will not accept it. What does God accept? He accepts imputed righteousness, or transferred righteousness. This righteousness is imparted to us or transferred to us at the point of faith. It will not be transferred to a human being through their own good works. It will only be transferred to them once they believe or trust in what Jesus has done. Romans 4 and verse 5 could not be clear. It says, but the one who does not work but believes. Let me say that again. But the one who does not work but believes. Believes in what? Believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is credited as righteousness. We come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We become aware of the futility and the folly of self-righteousness. We trust in the Savior. The Savior transfers His righteousness to us at the point of faith. And now we have a perfect standing with God. And it is only activated by faith. It will not be activated any other way. The book of Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9. Paul, and Paul knew something about this, didn't he? A man before his conversion steeped in religion. You can't get a more religious person than Paul who was once Saul of Tarsus. In the whole book of Philippians, particularly chapter 3, he describes his metamorphosis in his thinking. He writes in Philippians 3 and verse 9, "...and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own." That's self-righteousness. Not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. He describes in that chapter all his efforts as an unsaved man to keep the law, to keep the oral tradition surrounding the law. And in fact, he describes all of those things as scubula in the Greek. What does that mean? It means dog dung, dog manure, animal excrement. All of my religious activity, and Paul was steeped in it when he was Saul. In fact, he excelled at religion. All of it is animal excrement in comparison to the surpassing greatness of knowing him through the transferred righteousness that only Jesus Christ can give. How is it that we receive this transferred righteousness? Dr. Chafer writes as follows. It is grounded on an invisible person in heaven rather than on self or any human ability or character to the degree that its presentation to darkened Unregenerate minds must be supernaturally wrought by the Spirit of God. This is why Jesus, when he's describing righteousness in verse 10, says concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. The righteousness that comes from God is coming from the invisible Jesus Christ in heaven, not on the basis of of human effort, enterprise, 
and ingenuity. We have such a difficult time understanding this. Why is that? Because we are so performance-oriented. Where we think merit gains things, which in the natural world it does, doesn't it? Don't we have on our jobs performance appraisals? Don't we idolize in this culture self-made people? Isn't the lifestyles of the rich and famous and all of the books and all of the magazines idolizing people that pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps? Isn't that basic human tendency to idolize these things? Aren't we all oriented that way? Aren't we achievers? Aren't we winners? Don't we work hard? And the Holy Spirit has to invade the mind of what Dr. Chafer called uh, very articulately, the darkened, unregenerate mind. The darkened, unregenerate mind must be supernaturally convinced of something. And what does the Holy Spirit convince the darkened, unregenerate, proudful, boastful, arrogant mind who is as proud as a peacock because of his or her achievements? What does the Holy Spirit have to do? He has to work in such a way to convince them to the contrary. And I really appreciate what Dr. Chafer says in this quote. To make the unsaved realize this is a task too great for the preacher. It must be accomplished by the Holy Spirit. And to all of that, I can just say a hearty amen. Let me read that again. To make the unsaved realize this is a task too great for the preacher. It must be accomplished by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit must do this work of persuasion and conviction in the mind, or else the gospel, when it is preached, will remain a mystery to people. Because the gospel itself is so foreign to the way we think. It is so foreign to the way that the world system and the culture operates that there must be a work of God of convincing. Now, as we said last week, this work of convincing is not to be confused with regeneration. Regeneration is the impartation of divine life at the point of faith. However, a person who is darkened in the unregenerate mind, steeped in works righteousness, must be convinced of a spiritual reality before he can believe, before she can believe. And this is exactly what Jesus Christ is getting at here. He's sending out these eleven to be His ambassadors in the world. He is explaining to them what the Holy Spirit is going to start doing. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me, it will be the transferred righteousness from the invisible Jesus Christ in heaven at the right hand of the Father that will make men and women right with God on the basis of faith alone in Christ alone to the glory of God alone based on the Scripture alone. Yet the Spirit's got to plant the seed, do a work, Not to be confused with regeneration, but a work of convincing. I came under that convincing at 16 years of age. Everybody that is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ has to be convinced by something, better said, someone higher than themselves. God in His Grace condescends and uses sometimes human words. He can use our pathetic attempts at oratory to cooperate with this work. But it is not human oratory that gets the job done. It is ultimately the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit. The the man who led me to Christ was a worker as blue-collar as they come at Sears Roebuck. No formal education beyond high school. Not exactly what we would call an ultra-educated uh, individual. But the Holy Spirit in the spring of 1983 
at a home Bible study, chose to use this man's words to convince me, a 16-year-old, an individual who was steeped in works righteousness, darkened in my unregenerate mind, the Spirit of God used his words to awaken me to a truth that I could have not learned any other way. And that truth is I need the transferred righteousness of Jesus Christ, the man from heaven. All of my efforts and good works meant virtually nothing. And the Spirit of God convinced me of that through an individual that I love to this very day because God used him. But a man, by his own admission of very mediocre education and talent, the Holy Spirit doesn't need much to work with. In fact, it's astonishing that the Holy Spirit uses any of us. It's like when I'm emptying my, my dishwasher at home and I have my daughter and I say, can you help Daddy empty the dishwasher? And I've got to have all the groaning and dragging her over and, you know, all these kinds of things. And I say to myself, well, why don't I just empty the dishwasher myself? First of all, she can't even reach up to the shelves where I put things. But then I think to myself, I want to involve her in this because I want her to have the joy of what it's like to work, to be involved to be a participating member of the family. I could get the job done quite easily, but I condescend to her level because I have her in mind. You see, and this is how God works. He chooses to use our pathetic and inept attempts. And he condescends to our level and actually uses those things if we're cooperating with his agenda. And then we start seeing fruit. Why do we start seeing fruit? Because we're doing things His way and not our own way. What is the Spirit of God doing? Number one, He is convicting the world of sin, unbelief. Number two, He is convicting the world of righteousness, meaning the need for the transferred righteousness of the invisible man from heaven, Jesus Christ. But there is a third great thing that the Spirit of God seeks to convince us of. And you'll see that described in verse 11. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Number one, he convinces us of unbelief. Number two, he convinces us of the need for the transferred righteousness of Jesus Christ. And number three, he convinces us of judgment because the prince of this world, that would be Satan, has been cast out. And I've been reading this verse for years and I never really have understood it, in all honesty. Every time I read this verse, I think, wow, the Holy Spirit is going to work in people's lives in such a way that he is warning them of future judgment. In fact, I've taught it that way. Incorrectly, I might add. He's warning them of hell. He's warning them of the great white throne judgment. May I just say to you that that is not at all what he is speaking of here. He is not speaking of a future judgment. He is speaking of sin that has already been judged. Sin that was judged 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary through a transaction that we just celebrated this morning through the Lord's table. He is not convincing us of judgment to come. He is convincing us of judgment that has already come. You say, well, how do you know that? I know that because as you look at the end of verse 11, It says concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. It's talking about something that already happened. In fact, when you examine this word judged in the original language, how it's used here, this is a word that is used in the perfect tense of the Greek language. What does the perfect tense communicate? It communicates a one-time action in the past. One time it happened. Yet, ongoing benefits 
throughout the ages. He is not talking about something that will happen. He is talking about something that has happened. Again, Dr. Chafer writes, No reference is made by this phrase to a judgment to come. The reference is rather to the greatest of all human judgments, which is now past and was accomplished by Christ as substitute when he died, the just for the unjust, when the immeasurable billows of God's hatred swept over the one who had become a sin offering for those whom he died. They don't write like this today, do they? I mean, this is just fantastic language. He died the just for the unjust when the immeasurable billows of God's hatred swept over the one who had become a sin offering for those for whom he died. The Bible could not be clearer. It is not talking about a warning of a future judgment, which there is something to be warned of, but that's not what it's speaking of here. It is speaking of the fact that sin has already been taken care of. How do we get... In, into our minds this idea that sin has been taken care of. The Spirit of God must convince us of this. The Spirit of God must persuade us of this. The Spirit of God must convict us of this. I love the final words of Jesus Christ. John 19, verse 30. It says, Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The separation of the material from the immaterial, body from soul or spirit, which I understand is synonyms, there was a separation at that point. And that's what happens at death. What it is saying in roundabout terms is Jesus died. And the very last words that came out of his mouth before he died is the words translated in the English, it is finished. Three words. Now, when you go into the Greek language, there's not three words there. There's one word. That one word, I believe, is one of the most beautiful words in the entire Greek New Testament, it is the Greek word tetelestai, which simply means paid in full. In fact, the word tetelestai in John 19 and verse 30 is also in the perfect tense. Meaning, once again, a one-time action, a singular action in the past with ongoing benefits throughout the ages. Sin has been taken care of. The sin problem has been dealt with. It is not a matter of uh, us trying to somehow chip in to what God is doing. God bought lunch, let me leave the tip. God did 95%, let me do 5%, the way religionists teach this. What is there to add? There's nothing to add. It is finished, to telestai, paid in full. And yet the unregenerate mind is so steeped in a works mentality that it takes a supernatural convincing of the Spirit of God to get them to understand, to get all of us to understand that we can't add a thing to what Jesus has done because sin has been judged. God the Father poured out His wrath on God the Son. 2,000 years ago on a cross. When that transaction happened and Jesus died, the whole thing was over. Of course, Jesus' bodily resurrection from the, the grave validated or vindicated all of His sayings. But at that point in history, sin has been judged. Verse 11, And concerning judgment... Because the ruler of this world, not will be judged, has been judged. Now, the reference here to ruler of this world is very interesting. Because ever since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, Satan has become 
the ruler of this world. This is taught very clearly in John's other book, 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. John writes, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. Satan is running the show. In fact, in the second temptation, as recorded in Luke's Gospel, in Luke 4, verses 5 through 8, it reads, And he led him and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me. Who handed it over to the devil? Adam and Eve did. And I can give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship me, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. It is a theological fact that subsequent to the fall of man, Satan is running the world system. He is the God of this age. He is the prince and power of the air. He is the one that the whole world lies in his lap. And yet, what is Jesus saying here? Something changed with the cross. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. There was a decisive blow wielded by God against Satan, effectively dethroning Satan himself as the ruler of this world. In fact, as you go through the Bible, what you'll discover is Satan is not defeated in one foul swoop. His defeat is progressively revealed throughout the pages of Scripture. First, he was kicked out of heaven sometime in the past. And then, in Eden, following the fall of man, a prophecy was given that there is coming one who will crush his very head. Genesis 3 and verse 15. Satan in history worked overtime to prevent this coming one from entering the world. The whole Old Testament, including what was happening there in Genesis 6 with the sons of God and the daughters of men, all of it go under the category of Satan's attempt to prevent the birth of of Jesus Christ. And yet Jesus was born. He went to the cross. He paid a penalty for the sins of the world. And notice those verses that I have underlined there. Notice what happened at the cross. Isaiah 61.1 is actually not there, but it is a reference to Christ and it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. Because of what He did and the fact that sin has been judged, we have been released from captivity. Colossians 1 and verse 13 says, For He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Colossians 2 verses 14 and 15 says, Having canceled out the certificate of death consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, And He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When He disarmed the rulers and authorities, He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through Him. Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15 says, Therefore, since the children share in the flesh and blood, He Himself likewise also partook of the same that through death He might render powerless Him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And He might free those through fear of death who were subject to slavery all their lives. 
Satan was dealt a fatal and irreversible blow at the cross. Sin has already been judged. Now, you're saying, hold the phone, preacher. Why does the book of Ephesians say we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this dark world? If Satan has already been defeated, why is he still active? And the answer to that is he has been convicted. But the sentence hasn't been imposed yet. And even in our legal system, typically there are two phases to it. A person is arrested. They appear before a jury of their own peers as that jury finds them guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. They become convicted at that point. They then appear before the judge at a later point for sentencing, penalty. What has happened at the cross is the conviction of Satan is a done deal. The sentencing, however, will not be imposed until three subsequent events at the bottom of this list. Number one, he will be kicked out of heaven at the midpoint of the tribulation period. Even Satan in his fallen state, and the early chapters of the book of Job validate this, has access to the throne room of God. Not to worship and serve as he once did, but to communicate and to accuse. In fact, Jesus said to Peter one day, You know, Peter, Satan has been requesting permission to sift you like wheat. And if the Lord said that to me, I would say, I wish he hadn't have told me that. But that privilege of access to God's throne will be taken away. Once the millennial kingdom begins, the thousand-year reign of Christ, he will be bound in a place called the abyss. At the conclusion of that thousand-year kingdom, he will finally be thrown into where the beast and the false prophet were thrown in a thousand years later, a place called the lake of fire. And that will be the end of Satan. So we are living at a time in history where there has been a conviction. We are just waiting for the penalty. You see, and this gives us insight into the mind of Satan. Why is he so cruel? Why does he have such a win-at-all-costs mentality? Why is he so determined to take as many people down as he possibly can? Because you're dealing with a being that is defeated already. And he knows it. He knows it's just a matter of time before the penalty is imposed. And he is committed to destroying your life and destroying everyone's life as much as he possibly can because he knows he has no future. And yet, what happens to men and women who come under this convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit and learn this truth, but reject it, what happens to them? The only thing left for them is for them to experience the three final phases of the imposition of sentencing. If they will follow Satan, they will share in his sentence. John 3 and verse 18 says, He who believes in Him is not judged, but he who does not believe has already been judged, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. If a person is in unbelief, what is their condition before God? They are already judged, just the sentence hasn't been imposed yet. Penalty hasn't been imposed, but the verdict is in. It's, they are in the exact same condition Satan is in at the present time. Matthew 25 and verse 41 says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Did you know that hell itself was never created for people? The Bible says that very clearly. It was created for the devil and his angels. But you see, if a person will not respond to the truth of the gospel, if they come under the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit, and they will not respond 
what's their future? It's the same future that Satan and his fallen angels will experience. What is Jesus talking about here? He's talking about true evangelism. He is talking about these disciples, these apostles, these eleven, cooperating with the great work of the Spirit of God which is about to be manifested. Where the Spirit of God will convict the world of three things. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Working our way backwards, verse 11, the Holy Spirit convicts them of of sin. The fact that sin or sins have been judged already. Verse 11. Then He convicts them of righteousness. How righteousness is available to them only in Jesus Christ. Verse 10, the Spirit of God is convicting men and women of the need for the transferred righteousness of Jesus Christ. And number 3, going back to verse 9, the Holy Spirit convicts men and women of the fact that the only thing which will condemn them is their failure to believe. Dr. Chafer writes this, When the Spirit enlightens the Satan-blinded mind regarding sin, righteousness, and judgment that otherwise have blinded mind, that, excuse me, I misspoke, that otherwise blinded mind is at once more than normally enabled to understand the three great foundational truths that sin has been judged, righteousness is available in Jesus Christ, and the condemning sin is failure to believe that which now God offers the sinner, namely a perfect salvation in and through Christ the Savior. No soul can be saved from this enlightenment. For no other power is sufficient to break through the blindness which Satan has imposed on the minds of of those who are lost. It therefore follows that evangelism, which is adjusted to God's Word, let me say that again, it therefore follows that evangelism, which is adjusted to God's Word, will make a large place for the preliminary work of the Spirit and recognize that in answer to prayer alone, the souls of lost men may be moved to believe on Christ. I love this statement here about evangelism adjusted to the Word of God. Because, beloved, we don't have it. We have it in very small proportions today we have models we have practicums we have guides we have all sorts of strategies that largely are built and concocted by people without this foundation that we're talking about here we say the wrong things constantly in fact the gospel is so garbled today i am shocked that anybody gets saved We went through that list last time. Ask Jesus into your heart. Give your life to Christ. Make a commitment to Christ. Turn over the controls of your life to Christ. Believe and get baptized. Believe and keep the Ten Commandments. Submit to the Lordship of Christ. Repent or confess your sins. Sorrow. Pray the sinner's prayer. Come forward. On and on and on and on it goes. Ad nauseum, ad infinitum. And the Spirit of God is doing something and wants to use us to reach the lost, but we will not do it through our own methodology. We will do it as we cooperate with the power of the Spirit of God and His agenda in our world. You say, well, what's the application here? Well, here's the application. Number one, are you evangelizing? 
Because if you're not evangelizing, you're missing out on what the Spirit of God is doing. The Spirit of God is all about evangelizing the lost. Are you evangelizing? I have discovered that in the body of Christ, we do a much better job talking about evangelism than we do actually doing it. Very few Christians step outside of their comfort zone to share the gospel, even with workers. Sometimes, God forbid, even with family members. Because we are so paranoid of rejection. And yet we are standing on the shoulders of people, these 11, that went to a bloody grave sharing the gospel. And we are afraid of rejection here in the United States of America in the year 2014. How pathetic is that? A man asked Dr. Moody, J. Dwight Moody, founder of Moody Bible Institute. He came up to Moody and he said, you know, I, I disagree with your method of evangelism. And Moody said, well, what's your method of evangelism? And this fellow said, well, I don't have one. And Moody said, well, I like mine better. (laughs) Let's evangelize, folks. Evangelize or fossilize. You know, there's a, you go to Israel and there's two great seas there. There's the Sea of Galilee and there's what's called the Dead Sea. Why is one dead and one is alive? Why does plant life grow in one and fish and animals in one but not the other? And the answer is very simple. The Sea of Galilee takes in and then at the tip of it there in the north it gives out. So it's alive. What about the Dead Sea? It just takes in. There's no outlet. And how many of us have been sitting in Bible churches Week after week, month after month, year after year, hearing precious doctrines, and yet we never do anything with it. We're just like the Dead Sea. We just take it in. And the Holy Spirit is saying, I want to bring you to life. I don't want you to be like the Dead Sea. I want you to be like Galilee. And there is an excitement with the new believer. You know, how many times can you go to Disney World without committing suicide? I've been to Disney World 10,000 times. I've been to Disneyland 10,000 times. I've been on Space Mountain. I've been on all the rides. How many times can you do that without, without losing your sanity? But when you go with someone who's never been, like my eight year old daughter, it's all new to her. And I have the ability to live the initial excitement of Disneyland and Disney World through a child's eyes. How different the experience is. And see, many of us have heard the same stuff over and over again to the point of boredom. But when you lead a lost person to Christ and God privileges you with that, they're learning these things in the Bible church for the first time. And we can relive the whole experience through a child's eyes. And that does more to bring a church to life, perhaps, than any other single thing. What's the application? Evangelize. Evangelize or fossilize. And do it God's way. Remind people of the three great truths that they need to know. Number one, The sin they are committing against God, which will send them to hell, is unbelief. Number two, they need the transferred righteousness of Jesus Christ. And number three, the sin problem has all been taken care of. You may not have a polished approach, but just in conversations as the Holy Spirit opens doors to speak, try to gear the conversation around those three simple things and watch God work. Because you're cooperating with His agenda and no longer just doing your own thing, your own way. And there are those by way of application who may have never received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior at all today within the sound of my voice. The good news for you is you can do it right now where you're seated. 
You don't have to raise your hand, walk an aisle, join a church. Close your eyes, pray a prayer, come forward, do six cartwheels, cry, sob. You don't have to do anything like that. Simply trust in what Jesus has done. Shift all of your trust away from whatever it is you were, you were trusting in for your eternity exclusively to the promises of Jesus Christ and you in a nanosecond become a child of God on the authority of the Word of God. Do it right now as I'm talking. If it's something that you need more explanation on, I'm available after the service to talk. Shall we pray? Thank you, Father, for the simplicity of evangelism, the simplicity of the work of the Holy Spirit in this age. Help us to be focused this week on the lost. Help us to cooperate with your great agenda upon the earth to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. We will be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. And God's people said,